Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Night's Narrative Live. I'm Zev Shalev, waiting for Eric Garland to join us. He'll be here any minute now. We're having some technical issues. This is often the case when you come back from vacation. It's good to see everybody. Thank you very much for being back with us on Narrative. It wasn't really a vacation, sort of a, a work vacation. In that we didn't do shows, but we still worked ahead on a lot of important stories that are coming up on Narrative in the future uh, weeks. You might notice the set is green tonight. That's because we have a new sponsor for the month. Athletic Greens is coming on board and they're a terrific product. I'll tell you all about them in a bit later on. But we thought it'd be nice to make the set green and Somewhere over there, there's even some, prad- some products on the set, which is really nice to have. You can always take part in our conversation by going to narrative.org forward slash TV. That's where we have our interactive player where we can take your comments and questions. That's becoming a patron only feature in the next couple of days. So while it's still free for everybody, check it out. That's narrative.org forward slash TV. That's where we have your opportunity to take part of the conversation, ask questions or comment as the show goes on. So tonight on the show, we're going to talk a lot about Bucha, the horrific scenes that came out of Bucha and about the news that really the worst of the war is still ahead of us. You know, even though we've seen these atrocities out of Mariupol and also out of Bucha this weekend, there is much worse still ahead if this war continues at the pace it's been going. And one of the things I really wanted to talk about tonight was something that's really been lost in the breathless breaking news coverage over the last few days. And that's the fact that this is the first time in history that we are witnessing war crimes in real time during a war. In other words, there's always been war crimes. There's always been brutality in war. But this is the first time we've been able to record the horror of these events in real time and investigate them in real time while also having the legal framework to do something about it. So we have the international courts, uh, the criminal court in The Hague, which is able to prosecute these war crimes, and that's important. But now we also have the means to get the visuals and out of the war scene, out of the battleground, to the world. And that is why this is a particularly important moment for Americans and the world, really, as we face this massive challenge. You know, the fact that this is really the only time since... According to Peter Adams, you remember, I spoke to him a few weeks ago on the show about he's the NATO historian, and he tells me that this is the first time evidence of war crimes is being collected during a conflict rather than afterwards. So what that means is that there's potentially a a change in the way the policy of the public is going to view these events, because politicians are going to be overcome, one would expect, by the number of images that are coming out of the war zone and also by the, you know, the severity of these torture scenes. I mean, they're just horrific. We were looking today at some of the scenes, and I'll play you some in a minute from now, where there are mass graves, where there are people who have been bound and gagged and shot. And I mean, this is not uh, the kind of stuff that people can stomach for very long. So the fact that we actually now have evidence of these war crimes during the war means that there'll be a lot more pressure on the world to do more and a lot more pressure on Putin to stop doing what he's doing. Although, as we know, right now, there seems to be no indication that he's doing anything like that. So the war crimes agenda was really created by Joe Biden just a few weeks ago when he said he said it by mistake, but maybe he didn't, when he said that Putin was a war criminal. And in fact, you know, it seems to me that what we're looking at right now is a situation where the reality of it is this man is a war criminal. This man needs to be brought to justice, and we're going to have to do it by getting him to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. That is not going to be an easy undertaking. And that is why it is such a big challenge for the world right now to figure out what to do. It's the first time in history we've ever had these events where we can investigate them live, collect this evidence live. Plus, we have a very powerful leader in Vladimir Putin who's not going to be easily removed from power in order to come and face these allegations in court in The Hague. It was, in fact, Biden today who said that he believed that it was time for Putin to be tried. And hopefully that is, in fact, what's going to happen. And I should have some of that video here. Here's what Biden had to say this morning. You may remember I got criticized for calling Putin a war criminal. Well, the truth of the matter is saw what happened in Bucha. This warrants him, he is a war criminal. But we have to gather the information. We have to continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons they need to continue the fight. And we have to gather all the detail so this could be an actual, have a war crime trial. This guy is brutal. And what's happening in Bucha is outrageous. And everyone's seen it. Up to Allah. No, I think it is a war crime. I'm seeking more sanctions, yes. I'll have time to ask that to you. He should be held accountable. Well, no, 
I don't know, Joe, Joe, the war, the war crimes up. Yes, I'm going to continue to add sanctions. Thank you. I'll let you know. So that's uh, Joe Biden this morning talking about sanctions and Putin facing a war crimes tribunal. This is Eric Garland. Hi, Eric. How are you? Hello, Zev. You had me tap dancing all by myself at the start of the show. It's always fun to do. You know, I got through it, I think. We're talking about a very heavy topic tonight, at least for the first part of the show, as we were discussing, you know, what can be done to stop Putin. And I don't know if you caught the bit I was talking about just now, that, you know, by my account and by historians who I've spoken to, they suggest that this is the first time in history that we've been able to collect evidence of war crimes while those war crimes are being conducted, while the war is continuing. And then that makes it a bit of a game changer in terms of the way the public might perceive these events um, and the pressure that's going to be mounted on the international community to do something to stop it. Right. So we've had um, the technologies that keep advancing here can be real game changers in how these things go, right? Yeah. We, you know, we have spy satellites that are launched by the National Reconnaissance Office. And analysis is all done by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, one of the most effective and not very well-known agencies in, of all the 17. But their stuff is classified. Here's the thing. With like drone technology that can be operated in on a consumer level, mm-hmm. you can get a lot of the bang for the buck that you might get out of your full intelligence community's, you know, sensing abilities there, but they're not classified. So... You can have, you know, these vehicle, you know, you can have devices go over a battlefield space and you can have evidence that can be put before the world community. And all of a sudden, something that would have taken years to work out can be in the public in a day. And also the and, war itself has been, ta- you know, Putin's army has been such a failure in the field, even though it's obviously creating so much horror. In with having to withdraw and regroup as they're having to do right now, they're leaving a lot of this carnage behind because they've had to withdraw it because they basically have to regroup in order to try to take the East. So, you know, that's another reason we're just getting access to some of these visuals and some of these locations, perhaps in a way that we would not have gotten had the war gone according to Putin's plan, which has done nothing uh, like Putin's plan. I mean, we're now seven weeks into it, into what has become, you know, a, a quagmire for him and for the Ukrainians in, in a way that is just unbelievable. It seems to me that now what they're going to be doing is regrouping and taking a lot of their efforts to the east of Ukraine and then also trying to seal off that uh, access to the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. But we can talk a little bit more about the strategy a little bit later on. And we'll talk about a bunch of other things. But first, you may have noticed the set is green today because we have a new sponsor, Athletic Greens. And this is what they're about. Hey friends, it's Zev Shalev. It's becoming more and more expensive to buy groceries. And if you, like me, are trying to get all the nutrients and vitamins you need while still balancing your budget, good luck. It's nearly impossible to get all the nutrients you need just from food alone these days, never mind doing it on a budget. That's why I'm currently doing a 30-day Athletics Greens Challenge. The plan is simple. Take the AG1 supplement throughout April and track any increase in energy levels, overall well-being, and vitality and all while boosting my immune system. Today is day four, and the biggest fear people have about these green drinks is the taste, and I have to tell you, this one tastes pretty good. It's got a tropical flavor to it, and it's pretty noticeable when you get a boost of energy after you're drinking it. AG1 is engineered to provide all the right nutrients at just the right time of day. Whether you want increased energy or improved muscle recovery, they've got it covered. And because they care about your wallet too, AG1 will only cost you around three bucks a day and there are no hidden fees. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash narrative. That's the way we spell narrative, N-A-R-A-T-I-V. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash narrative, N-A-R-A-T-I-V. To take ownership over your health and pick the ultimate daily nutritional insurance, Athletic Greens AG1. I'll get you, I'll get you some, Eric. It looks not that good looking a drink but it actually tastes really really good and it's got like a lot of good nutrients and it's uh it's it makes me feel really good after drinking it so who knows well, excellent me? yeah thank you ag1 for being here we should have an eg1 too for you <laughs> 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 actually you know they, they, these guys have done so many um they've done 53 variations on this particular drink they've they keep updating it every year with different uh different nutrients and things as science catches up and uh and they've keep they've kept it as being the leading uh Green's drink on the market. So um, do you remember much about Bosnia? I mean, for me, it was 
I reported on them. I remember being in the news business at the time, but Bosnia is a long time ago. But a lot of the people are saying that this is very similar to Bosnia, and particularly because Radovan Karadic, remember him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the butcher of Bosnia. I mean, he... Srebrenica, I, I, I believe. Uh, but also the siege of Sarajevo was also another thing that he was responsible for. It took 25 years for Karadzic to be convicted. He did have to go to the international court and he did have to face the court and he was sentenced to life. And I want to play you a little bit of what the news looked like on the day he was actually convicted, which was, you know, 25 years later. Think about how long these people had to wait yeah. to get some sort of resolution to the nightmare they'd been through. Here's what Al Jazeera reported on that day. The faces of the dead of the Srebrenica massacre, remembered by their loved ones. Victims of the genocide perpetrated by Bosnian Serb leader Radovan Karadzic. It has taken nearly 25 years for justice to be realized, a painful journey often bereft of hope. But the wait has finally come to an end. Karadzic listened intently as the court listed his grounds for appeal and rejected them almost entirely. The prosecution's appeal in all other respects sets aside Judges de Prada and Rosa Rosa dissenting the sentence of 40 years of imprisonment and imposes Judge de Prada and Rosa dissenting a sentence of life imprisonment. Outside the tribunal, it was a decision welcomed by all who had gathered there, but the suffering is never far away. I am satisfied, but I want to ask Karadzic, which school did he go to to learn how to kill our children, our sons, our husbands? I am satisfied, but then again I am not, because I no longer have my children. In Srebrenica itself, tears of relief fell when the tribunal announced it would increase Karadzic's sentence. This is one of the last remaining rulings dealing with the brutal breakup of Yugoslavia. And the sentencing of Radovan Karadzic is also being seen as a crucial test, holding de facto leaders to account for crimes committed during conflicts. The case has been one of the most high-profile legal battles of the Yugoslav wars. More than 8,000 Muslim men and boys were slaughtered in the Srebrenica massacre. It was the worst genocide to have taken place in Europe since World War II. While the town has become symbolic of the very worst atrocities that took place in the Balkans during the war, it has also been a milestone for the legal consequences that followed. It took 20 years, and let's hope it's not going to take 20 years for Syria, for Yemen, for all of these other places where similar atrocities are being committed. We as an international community have to be more committed to bring justice to the victims way sooner than 20 years. Radovan Karadzic will now spend the rest of his days behind bars. His genocidal actions scarred an entire region, and they leave behind a legacy of anguish from which many will never recover. So that's uh, Al Jazeera's reporting. That took 20, 25 years to get to this point. And, you know, Karadzic yeah. is not Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is entrenched in power and has got one of the biggest armies to back him up. And he's not going anywhere in a hurry. It certainly seems like, uh, you know, the only reason Karadzic made it to the, the ICC was because ultimately he lost the war. There is not much chance here of Putin losing this war. Well, it depends on what you mean by losing. I mean, it seems unlikely that, you know, Ukraine's going to counter-strike and, you yeah, know, invade Russia. Uh, Russia yes. You know, they, somebody on the Ukrainian side there uh, did uh, strike a fuel depot on the so other bad. on the other side, you know, and that's that's your first symbol. Like, hey, guys, this is not this is not going well. I mean, this is strategically, this has been a disaster of unmitigated <laughs> proportions for yes. Putin and, uh, you know, their economy is collapsing. You know, we keep seizing yachts, fun places. And, you know, this vaunted, you know, this very big army they had, you know, we have had the greatest show of what they're actually capable of, mm. which is an inability to pack enough protein bars. And, you know, <laughs> they're using, you know, as we've spoken on about this on the show previously, using consumer electronics that are wide open to everyone hearing. I mean, it's almost confusing how bad these guys are at military stuff at this point. It has been kind of an unmitigated disaster. That's a good way of putting it. But 
still, you know, the, the disaster has been inflicted mostly on the Ukrainian people. It's not the Russians sure. who are feeling it yet. You know, there have been some economic sanctions that have begun to bite, but we're still a long way away from the full weight of those economic sanctions hitting Russia. And I, I think it was you who told me on this show that one of the key things that were involved in those sanctions that we put up against Russia was that they were not going to be able to use the dollar to basically pay down their debts, which they have still been able to do because the Biden administration has given them up until May the 25th to still use their dollar supplies, if they have them, mm. to pay off their debt. So up until now, they haven't hit the point where they're about to crash, where the economy is about to go completely bankrupt. But one would think that after May 25th, if there's enough pressure on Biden not to continue allowing the U.S. dollars to be used by the Russians, that could change things a lot, obviously, because it will just uh, plunge them into almost immediate bankruptcy. I mean, I think you know, on the U.S. side, you have to be careful about just how chaotic uh, Russia becomes. Mm. Uh, this was a problem for us after the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, you've got suitcase nukes and things that are taken care of by certain individuals. And you generally want those individuals to continue to get paid and show up and, you know, not sell off uh, suitcase nukes to mobsters or you yeah, know, I mean, look, no one other, other organizations. <laughs> um, it's kind of like the size of Russia collapsing into default, but it's, you know, that at least seems to be a good threat to hold up over his head in terms of stopping this the atrocities. I mean, it seems like if this is, if Bush was just the, not the worst of the scenes. If they're telling us now that Mariupol and other parts of Ukraine are far worse than Busha, then I don't know how much the public is going to take on that. Well, I mean, the Russians commit war crimes yeah. as a matter of course, but that's how they do it. <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, they treat their own soldiers brutally and none of this is new for them and their behavior. This is the first time though, and I'm going to go to technology on this, you know, these little cell phones that people have that have cameras in them now. Hmm. You're able to collect information from a battle space or, you know, the aftermath thereof and, you know, report the civilian atrocities in real time. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty new. And they're being introduced to the Russian way of war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this doesn't even count what Wagner's been up to in different places. And, you know, you may recall uh, there were chemical assaults on Syrian children mm -hmm. that I believe were carried out by Russian, you know, mercenaries, but Russians no less. And, uh, and yeah. there Wagner and Mali, and there's a lot of examples of that, this. That police are paid from the uh, Al Jazeera. It's at the end, there, they were talking about, you know, what about Syria? What about Yemen? What about all these other places that haven't had the same sort of justice in the international court? It's really the Bosnia that seems to be the most like biggest example of where they've succeeded. And one of the challenges around the International Criminal Court is that the three biggest leaders of the world, you know, the United States, China, and Russia, are all not members for their own various reasons of the ICC, which is a, you know, an interesting conundrum because now we, here we are appealing to the ICC to say, please do something about these war crimes. Uh, you know, we need a war crimes tribunal, but we're not a party to that. The reason we're not a party to that are twofold, and you'll be fine, some of this might be interesting. One of the reasons we're not a party to it is because we don't want them to have territorial jurisdiction over the United States. In other words, if there are war crimes committed in the United States, they shouldn't have jurisdiction over that, which is just sort of, you know, domestic in, uh, integrity and sovereignty. But the other reason also involves Israel. A lot of the reasons that the United States has shunned the ICC is because they've threatened for so much to put Israel up in front of the uh, International Criminal Court. Now, relations with Israel are different now than they were in the past. And it might be interesting to see if that dynamic actually means that we can see more support for the ICC from the Biden administration. You know, it was Donald Trump who sanctioned the ICC and he almost threatened to arrest any of the judges that were, that were on the ICC. Uh, Biden you know, reversed those sanctions. But we now know that probably the reason that uh, Trump did that, the original sanctions of the ICC, was because of Israel and uh, their support for Trump. You know, and then there's the general attempt to poison American leadership on um, human rights issues. Mm. And that's very much in the interest of China and Russia. Um, just think of what China gets up to in Xinjiang mm -hmm. and uh, Russia, where it gets up to anywhere it goes. And they have always, for the past century, since the two world wars in America, coming out as a world leading hegemon in terms of geopolitical power, you know, one of the things that America had as uh, in terms of soft power was that we didn't militarily dominate all the places that we could have post-World War II. Mm -hmm. We were putting out aluminum at such a rate 
uh, we, you know, for battleships and bombers and whatnot, that at that moment, you know, America very plausibly could have taken over the world and did not and rebuilt some of its, you know, its very recent adversaries, Germany and Japan being two big ones. Uh, you know, that's of course not to say that America doesn't have plenty of its own stories of human rights abuses, including war crimes here and there. But if you're going to rank us, you know, with Russia and China, America is going to come out on top <laughs> of, of, of being the best oh, yeah. to deal with. Sure, sure. And they don't want us having that. They don't want us to have that kind of moral authority in order to ding their reputation. So having Trump uh, sanction the ICC judges was a good way to, since, you know, Trump was obviously being, he was not serving the United States' interests at any given time. I mean, we rarely, you know, even revisit because Blinken's leadership at uh, state has been so smooth and strong that you forget that, you know, Trump spent four years absolutely ripping our diplomatic service apart. And again, there we wanted to, you know, the, whoever was pulling the strings on Donald Trump wanted the United States as disengaged from the world as possible. Well, until recently, until, you know, almost a month before the war started, we didn't even have an ambassador to Poland because of the GOP was still, you know, playing games on the foreign front. So we still did not have complete, you know, even though they claim to be united on this issue of Ukraine, I still question a lot of the GOP's real integrity on these issues. And, uh, you know, certainly if they're going to run Donald Trump again with, uh, you know, the pro-Putin background that he has, I mean, how are they going to do that? How are they going to run President Trump in 2024? It's just like, I don't see it. I think they're going to try. Yes, the GOP, the GOP does have some integrity issues. Uh, with <laughs> Breaking news. Just across the board. Uh, yeah, and, you know, I don't know. You know. The presidency of Donald Trump speaks for itself. Mm, it just does. So, yeah, you know, they, I mean, still have, they still have some explaining to do. <laughs> It's still, they have a lot of explaining to do, but I also don't think the American public is yet aware of the consequences, or maybe they're aware, maybe they're just blindly going into it, that, you know, we are going to see a decline in democracy and democratic uh, institutions in a way we've never seen before if there's a second Trump term there. I mean, it would be uh, chaotic to say the least if he continued on the path he was already started in the first term. It'll be quite something. Right. You know, world events are moving so fast right now mm. that speculating on whether Trump will be available to run for president, much less run for president. He's also getting on in years, um, you know, between Sanders and Biden and Trump, you know, we're starting to believe that people can be, uh, you know, <laughs> can run for president in their early 80s. But it's a really big job. And, you know, I don't think Trump had that much fun. I don't think he it. did. They just, like the, they just like the power, I think, more than anything else. But, it, you know, it is worth reminding people, and I'm going to do this a lot before we get into the next elections and the ones and the presidential, is that this is a real risk to democracy. I mean, it's not like the first term. It'll be much worse than this first term if he gets back into power. And there's certainly any attempt to support the GOP in any way without them completely denouncing their connection to Russia. You know, I mean, that can't be allowed. It can't, it can't be and China. Exist. And China. And Israel. And Israel. Anymore, Saudi and maybe Arabia. Malaysia and <laughs> uh, and Saudi and the Emirates, um, you know. But yeah, you know uh, those countries, they seem called yeah. the axis of evil. North Korea, <laughs> just to add one more. Uh, you know, here's the thing. You know, a, a lot of uh, the narrative right now, a lot of the the story is about America of its own will, whether it's from predominantly from one political party or another, doesn't really matter at that point. You know, we started engaging with autocracies. And, and this can you can trace this back to, you know, Nixon and Kissinger, if you will, you know, opening up with with China and beginning the process of engagement there. Now, I'm not saying, the, you know, Nixon's trip to China was a bad thing, but, you know, in the 1990s kind of had uh, during the Clinton administration, we had a couple strategic you know, decisions because, you know, the Soviet Union had come apart and there's China and uh, the Sino-Soviet alliance isn't there anymore. they really, you know, they, the whole Russian the Federation and the former Soviet states are kind of a mess, mm -hmm. to put it lightly. And so what are we going to do? You know, gird our loins and prepare for China's rise. And then we're basically going to be at, a, uh, you know, an adversarial position, or are we going to engage with them economically and, you know, saying, you know, it's now it's glorious to get rich. Mm -hmm. And we started our companies started moving over there and uh, doing a lot of business, our banks, our some law firms, you know, and we started giving them a lot of manufacturing you know, taking jobs out of the U.S. and sending a whole lot of money their way. And they fine. were still an autocracy. Yeah. 
Yeah, but they had big promises, right? The whole thing along the way was that they were going to find some sort of enlightenment, that they were going to move towards being more positive on human rights. And they, and they, that was a basically a lie. Either it was a lie or they just changed their mind. But they certainly uh, backtracked on that idea in the Obama administration. Uh, you know, this was a discussion had at work today that there was a lot of wishful thinking on the part of American business executives and politicians and, and uh, their assumptions about China and the Chinese uh, disposition towards the United States and its own future. Uh, it was just that people did not understand that, you know, this is a culture that has been around and been very, very successful and very powerful over the past 2000 years. And it views the last 200 as, you know, a series of very unfortunate events, you know, you go back to the British and the opium wars and, uh, you know, they view that as being pushed around by Western powers and they'd never had such a thing in their long history. You know, they were pretty sore about it. And, and uh, sorry. Stopping Putin. I mean, stopping Putin really involves China. I mean, there, that is the alliance which continues to be the most threatening to the world balance of power is this alliance between Xi and Putin. And the more Putin does a terrible job in Ukraine fighting this war, the more likely it is that China will sort of distance themselves away from Putin and then maybe even stop some of their aggression that they might be planning in Asia. But if the war changes and things go well for Putin, you might see Xi be emboldened and continue to do what many people have suspected, which would mean, uh, you know, try to take Taiwan following Putin in Ukraine. Now, the timing gets a little screwed up because the fighting season has uh, passed. But, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe there's a way for them to do that next year. So looking at this just strategically, it's really important that Putin gets stopped and Putin gets caught in a quagmire in Ukraine, which we don't want because of the civilian casualties, or he just has to be completely stopped. I mean, the continuation of the ideas that Putin and Xi have in mind, which is this broad dictatorship across the world, that is no good for any of us. I mean, that's just not going to be healthy. Um, and if they get anywhere close to doing any of that, that's very dangerous. Well, I'm going to call this one, you know, Putin has lost the war he started in Ukraine. They're making a mess on their, on their way back. If the unclassified uh, information that we get about their materiel is at all accurate. They've taken massive losses that impair the functioning of their military. Mm -hmm. And they've achieved none of their objectives. Uh, they did get caught in a quagmire. Think about America going way, and this is right next door to Russia, right? And it's got, they've got help from Belarus, right? This is, they couldn't get too much more home court advantage than this. Now we'll go back to America invading Iraq in 2003 and how fast we got our initial objectives done there. Now, they didn't listen to Eric Shinseki, who says you're going to need 500,000 guys. <laughs> and, and they had terrible, terrible planning. I am not citing the Iraq War of 2003 as a successful example of military strategy. However, you know, we got in there, we blew up their air force, you know, we are, are you know, armored cavalry, yeah. you know, we, initial we were in Baghdad quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now that attracted, you know, that, that then made the U.S. Uh, military a target. So every irregular troop in, you know, T-shirts, jeans and Kalashnikovs could come in and plant bombs and all that. But let's just talk about this in terms of not a counterinsurgency, but just military. We had more stuff than they did. Our stuff worked better. Our guys are more experienced. And, you know, Saddam Hussein didn't have a chance. And we got it. We got it done quick. And um, afterwards, in the quagmire for some time. Well, the, yeah, we won the war and, and really screwed up the peace. But that's, you know, that whole story has yet to be told. But in this case, this is Putin is on home field advantage. I mean... You know, they used I'm to run the place on whether he's right next door. Losing. I'm going to push back on whether he's actually losing. Um, I'm also going to answer this question that someone has in the chat, which is, will he ever be held accountable? Will the ICC actually be able to charge him? I have an answer to that. Um, you know, the, there's a question about, I mentioned the United States is not a signatory to the ICC, and neither is Russia. So how are they going to get Putin? Well, what they do have jurisdiction of is Ukraine, because Ukraine is a signatory. So any country where they have a member state, those countries... They can target individuals who've committed crimes in those countries, no matter where those people are. So that is why at least the, the ICC believes they'll be able to charge Putin. I think he might have different thoughts than that. He might have a challenge to that by saying, hey, I'm not even 
member of your organization. How could you charge me? But we'll see what happens. That's going to be a battle that we're still going to fight. But technically speaking, he can be charged and brought in front of the ICC because uh, Ukraine is a member. And that's not the only place he can be indicted, as yeah. we're learning. Uh, you know, they uh, seized, uh, was this just yesterday? Like, there's so much going on, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's hard keeping track some days. The Spanish agreed to seize the yacht of Victor Vexelberg, who I think is like the third richest dude in Russia after Putin, who, of course, had paid a certain amount of money to Michael Cohen, who illegally, uh, I think he was an investor in what, Gawker as well. He's a guy who gets up to a lot of tomfoolery. And they seized his like $90 million yacht as part of a charges that I think SDNY has the... um, uh, it's the Southern District of New York, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, has jurisdiction. And if I understand some of the jokes of some of the ex SDNY people on Twitter, they're like, uh, SDNY's jurisdiction reaches somewhere around Neptune, <laughs> you know, because anything that's, you know, dollar denominated, mm-hmm. you know, flows through New York banks at some point, which gives them the jurisdiction. Whether, you know, whether or not we have an MLAT treaty that will, you know, or an extradition treaty to get. That, you know, the person sent to us is another matter, but anything with dollars can be charged in SDNY for the most part. And if you read the documents, when they seized this asset, it was as part of a bank fraud and money laundering charge Mm. against him. So, I mean, certainly that's what they did. That's what they do with all these fancy cars and the fancy yachts and the fancy condos is they launder money through them. So certainly stands to reason. That's well, and they had, there was like 40 to 50 shell companies in between him and the ownership of that yacht. And I believe the statement of the U.S. government is that if you use that as a criminal action to evade sanctions. So, you know, they structured these things and they used U.S. dollars and something bounced off of New York and they're like, bam. So they had Spain. They made uh the request to Spain and Spain honored it you know, yeah, off the Isle of Mallorca. The sad part about it is that we've known about this for so long. And yet the American banks, all banks really around the world, have been continually engaging in this sort of money laundering efforts for these oligarchs. Sort of, even though they knew about yes, it. Yes, they, they have. Reports, they just, yeah, they were doing it. They knew they were doing it. Just let it happen. They just kept it going, which is really how we got to where we are today. Is this sort of like endless amounts of money laundering that was just funneled through these banks without any consequences. Mm-hmm. Yep, mm. that's right. Speaking of consequences, you know, the Russians have decided that they can deny everything that happened in Busha by saying, that's not true. The, these are actors. These are crisis actors. These are people that, the, the victims, I mean, that the Ukrainians brought in after the fact and are making a fake scene. Now, because of technology, as we mentioned earlier, these things can be disproven these days. It's not the same as it was, you know, back before the satellites that you could just claim these things were fake or not be seen at all. Now we know that they did in fact happen while the Russians occupied those territories, thanks to American spy satellites, which have been releasing all these incredible pictures. I'm going to just pull up some here for you because it's right up your alley for one thing. And this is from the Wall Street Journal that filed this report today. And this is their, their report on how they believe they've pretty certain that the Russians were there when these war crimes were happening. This satellite image appears to show corpses on a road in Bucha, Ukraine, while the city was occupied by Russian forces. The commercial satellite company Maxar said this image was taken on March 18th, while Moscow says that no residents had suffered from violence from its troops and claims that bodies were placed on the streets after its forces retreated from the city at the end of March. This footage shared on social media on April 1st shows the same road. And some of the elements we see in this clip are also visible in the satellite image. The car swerves around corpses. There's a dead body on the left. And across the street is a car. Then at the intersection, there's a damaged vehicle and another body nearby. Western leaders said they would help investigate the deaths in Bucha and alleged war crimes there and elsewhere in Ukraine. So that is what we call this uh, open source intelligence. Of- I mean, this is really amazing stuff. Is here we've got these images being released to the public by this American uh, satellite company. And it being pretty easy to figure out that this happened on this particular day because these came from March, these satellite images when the Russians had occupied Bucha. And, you know, just FYI that, you know, the Maxar, that's a commercial satellite company. 
that's not even what the intelligence community can do because what our guys can do is way, way sharper images of all that. And then cross that with signals intelligence to know, you know, exactly who was where doing what at what time and, you know, put all that together. And that's how you can get some very high confidence interval assessments that's a good done. point, especially because they were using commercial gray phones maybe for their communication. They would know a lot more about what was going on in Busha than it meets the eye. And certainly they uh-huh. could reference that. That's a very good point. The same mm-hmm. thing apparently about Mariupol, you know, that a lot of the uh, Red Cross efforts in Mariupol the last few days were also collecting evidence for any possible war crimes, charges against Putin or the Russians. So these are actively being investigated during a war, which when I spoke to our friend Peter Caddick Adams, who's the NATO historian, was on the show just a few weeks ago. I emailed mm-hmm. him today and I said, you know, what is so significant about what's going on with this? Why is it so different? And I'll read you the quote, which he said, we didn't stop any war crimes in Bosnia, sadly. We knew of isolated instances at the time, but not of the scale of Srebrenica until afterwards. The arrival of the NATO Peace Implementation Force, I-4, came after the Dayton Peace Accord in 95. It was brokered by the late Madeleine Albright, who knew a thing or two herself about having to flee as a refugee. This is the Mm -hmm. first time evidence of war crimes is being collected during a conflict rather than afterwards. It'll be aided by the new science of forensic archaeology, which grew out of investigating both Rwanda and Bosnia. That's uh, Dr. Peter Caddick Adams, the very noted NATO historian who was just with us a a week or so ago on the show. Peter's very smart about these things, was also, you know, part of the Rwanda investigation of the genocide there and also the NATO historian in Bosnia. So he certainly knows what he's talking about. And, uh, that's interesting. That's his initial uh, thing is that we're going to be, you know, investigating these war crimes while this war is still continuing. It's going to be very, very complicated for Putin. So I'd like to do a little more spook explaining mm. on what the capabilities of our guys, and this is more logic uh, than it is in revealing anything classified, certainly. But, you know, our signals intelligence capability that's, you know, shared by a number of countries, you know, if these guys have got consumer grade electronics on them. Mm. I mean, never mind the fact that NSA exists to have Russian comms busted, you know, at any given time. That's, you know, that's their mission. Mm. This is a, a very, very easy thing for them. If you're talking about these people brought their own phones right. where they're calling their moms on them, right? We can hack into those phones and turn on the camera mm. and we can turn on the microphone without the person knowing it. That's, right. a, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a putt from two inches. That's, yeah. uh, kicking the ball in an open it. net. <laughs> then they can do it. <laughs> well, that's, there, there we go. That's right. Uh, you know, that's not even half of what's on the NSO group yeah. Pegasus, uh, solution in a box. Have you ever read those sales pitch manuals from Pegasus? They, yeah. They, they didn't pitch them to me. <laughs> uh, I've seen the ones that they uh, did to our local police departments. Yeah. And yeah. it's like a FISA warrant. It's like, you can have your very own FISA warrant on whoever the hell you want without going to a court. I'm like, isn't this great? Did any of our police departments actually do anything with that? I mean, I don't think so. I don't think any of them actually bought any of that uh, stuff, did they? Yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. under investigation. <laughs> In that same period of time, there was a lot of uh, police to police connections between Israel and uh, mm-hmm. American sheriff's departments and stuff like that. Oh, there's much more to learn there. Yeah, there is. But there is. Bill Barr was around so, with, in all of that as well, I think, doing a lot of, uh, you know, meetings with local police departments, which is unusual, if I remember correctly. But back to Ukraine here. I mean, we've got a situation where you're talking about it's being pretty easy to track what these people are doing on their on their cellular phones and then cross referencing. And you're you know real time. You know, and remember, we can decla. You know, there's sources and methods out there, but we're not talking about like some advanced submarine communications. We don't want to let them know that we've busted the new version of this. These are like freaking Chinese cell phones that are consumer grade. In other words, when the time is right, we could declassify a bunch of that stuff and put it out in public at a time of our choosing without really compromising what people know about our capabilities. And once that's declassified, we could hand that over to The Hague. Mm. And I mean, something you need, like, well, first of all, in 2014, you know, we know this because this story came out in 2018. But in 2014, when Russian intelligence was hacking into the State Department and Joint Chiefs of Staff, that the Dutch intelligence, AIPD, their military intelligence for external gathering, they had the Russians busted down to having the cameras in their offices. So they were watching them hack the State Department in real time and had everything keylogged. This is eight 
solid years ago. That's how far we've been, you know, tunneled inside those, yeah. you know, their stuff. Yeah, right. That was a really interesting case. So the Dutch were, you know, probably the most powerful piece of intelligence gathering throughout the whole Trump Russia period was that Dutch uh, investigation into the Russians. That was pretty impressive what they did there with those cameras. That we know about, right? That's what we they were willing to give up and just remind them like, hey, assholes. <laughs> like yeah. we, you know, we have and video that, we, every we, we, we know exactly who did what. Yeah. And I mean, and, you know, we've been giving out some more warnings in the form of indictments when Mueller indicted the IRA and, you know, Russian military intelligence. I almost fell off my chair. I'm like, I'm reading the individual military intelligence officers down to their patronymic middle names. Like and we know. positions that were sitting in, in the office and which phones they were using, yep. which computers they were using and how they, I mean, it was a lot, a lot of information. That was a very detailed indictment. Very, very detailed. Very, very detailed. So all that stuff was declassified. It was like, you know, we're like, yeah, we don't mind if they know that we have them disowned. Yeah. So we've been letting them know, like, guys, we're, you know, we're, we have eyes. We're, we're able, we, we we're, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we, we see you. And well, we now their military has gone into another country and appears to be committing war crimes. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, brought with them their own technologies that could help put them all away criminally around the world. And that's really, you know, that's a first. Mm -hmm. So this is a historic moment for that. And, you know, it's, I don't think they're going to have to wait the 25 long, long years that the survivors of the ex-Yugoslav genocide, yeah. you know, that they had to wait. Probably won't have to wait that long, but they will have wait a long time to try to get Vladimir Putin. I think that's the challenging here, thing here is that, you know, for him to actually hand himself over or to be handed over is going to be a, an act of the Russian state when he's not a leader of that state, I, I think. Unless he gets, you know, he gets made nabbed somewhere else. But this is the map of the territory that they're still going after. They've now retreated around Kiev. They've sort of reassembling their forces as best they can. And they're going to, yeah, their forces. Um, and then they're, you know, they're going to come back down and try to take this whole region of Luhansk, Donetsk, all the way through Mariupol, Crimea, and also first missiles fired in Odessa. To me, this is still a, a huge, huge, huge victory. If Putin is allowed to keep any of this, it would be ridiculous. You know, that is not a loss. That is a win for him if he's allowed to keep any territory in Ukraine. And we shouldn't be allowing him to. There's sort of this notion, in, even from Zelensky, that, you know, he can keep parts of Lohansk and Donetsk because he's already taken those. To me, the, the criminality and the awfulness of what they're doing in Ukraine should disqualify them from having greater access to one of the world's most important ports. I mean, you know, economically, this is such a big boon for them. Why would we let them get away with this? It seems to me that we have to stop them now, not allow them to continue this crazy marauding through the eastern Ukraine. And then we're left with the same question again of how do we do that without actually going to war with Russia? Well, I mean, you said uh, that you know, they've, they've given them until, you know, May 25th to uh, still use their U.S. dollar reserves. Yeah. Well, what if that timetable got moved up? Like, oops, wow, when we said that, we didn't know how many war crimes you've committed. So now we're going <laughs> to... I, I, I predict... That far away. You know, it's, you know... No, six, six, away, six, yeah, six, yeah. six weeks. I mean, I predict that Russia is going to be out of Ukraine entirely. This thing where, you know you just start taking chunks of other people's countries mm -hmm. and you have some complicated rationale for it. You know, it was a mistake for us to let that go and to go, well, you know, Crimea is very Russian and that's true. Also, you know, the United Nations, we don't, you know, allow countries to violate other countries, territorial. So Brooklyn. I mean, Brooklyn is, is very Russian too. We don't allow them to take that too. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, <laughs> All right. it's not a good reason it's just because people speak Russian there. I mean, historically it might've been, part of it. But, uh, you know, the, the new system in the world is that countries have borders. We respect them. We don't go attacking them, except yep. in Putin's case. But I mean, we allowed him to do that in Crimea. We allowed him to do it in Donbass. We allowed him to do it in the Transnistria area there. We allowed him to do it in Georgia. We just keep letting him do it. And if we allow him to get any of this territory here, we are going to give him such great access to warm water ports all year round if he gets to Odessa. I mean, even Mariupol, I think, is a warm water port, port isn't it? I'm not sure. But um, certainly it's Odessa. It's, is a, warm water it's port. a hell of a lot warmer than Arkhangelsk and, uh, and Murmansk. And, uh, and Petersburg, even. So, you know, these are not 
you know, these are important territorial gains for yeah. him. Strategically, this is really what he wants. He oh, wants yeah. to try and gain this territory along the ocean sea. It would be devastating for the economy in the Ukraine. And also don't forget that so much of the world's wheat comes from Ukraine and Russia. And by controlling this area, he will essentially control the wheat market around the world. Uh, not to mention the other things that might come from Russia and Ukraine that people need. Uh, you know, this is this a lot is of natural non- gas there yeah. too. Um, this is a non-starter. They can't, you know, we have to stop having this conversation that this is going to be okay if he just takes those little Eastern regions. No, you should not take those Eastern regions from a, from a geopolitical point of view. It's incredibly damaging to, to everybody and it gives him even greater power, which he's not earned, you know, he's not, certainly he's not deserving of any of it. It, it just means he's going to keep increasing Approaching on the West, and this is going to happen on a regular basis over the next few years, war after war after war, and we can't do sure. that. So it's got to, you know, we know that we can't let him do it, but we are seeming to let him do it. So we've got to try stop him now, or we've got to find some alternative solutions that make sense for the world. You know, I've, I've proposed maybe Mariupol becomes an international port city that other countries can help run or something like that. But to give it to Russia after the massacre and the you know genocidal activity they've been doing there, it's really unacceptable. I mean, I would imagine that uh, we're going to expect a complete retreat back across their borders Mm -hmm. before we let up on the economic sanctions. And there's a whole nother bunch of those sanctions dropping tomorrow. Right. But how many people are going to have to die before that happens? I mean, that's the problem is that there's the attacks on civilians are so indiscriminate and it's so horrendous. You know, and how long, how much of this can the people stomach? How much of the, can the world really stomach seeing, you know, night after night of atrocities and, and let it happen? It just seems, you know, this is the way the Russians fight. I know, but boy, it's a lot for us to deal with. You know, it's, it's funny. And national security is a subject that um, some people find boring or, you know, dry or it's and it's got a lot of funny language around it, um, as, you know, its own jargon. And it's one of those things that you want to be able to forget about. But in order to be able to forget about it, somebody's got to be thinking about the stuff constantly, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> this is what the consequences are, you know, this is life and death stuff. This is, you know, there are regimes in the world that in order to achieve their objectives, you know, they'll blow up as many kindergartens as it takes so they can get a warm water port or whatever. Mm. The Russians are one such people that uh, are willing to uh, comport themselves in that way. And, you know, it's in our interest to knock them back and impose heavy costs not just for them, but for any other country that would dare to act similarly. But, you know, when you've got, you know, we were in a situation where just a couple of years ago, we had a president who was essentially in their pocket and maybe a while before we understand why certain decisions were made during the Obama administration. If if you recall, you know, Obama walks in in early 09 and the banks are on fire. Um, You know, the, the housing crisis has collapsed. And I believe FinCEN has come out somewhat recently and said, yeah, there was a, you know, a uh, heavy foreign money component to that collapse. So oh, really? it was sort That's of interesting. A, interesting. I believe so. And it's as I, you know, quite a bit if it was engineered by our friends, you know, speaking of Barack Obama, I have so much I wanted to talk to you about, but it's already eight o'clock. I can't believe that. What a quick hour. But, uh, you know, he visited the White House today. I'm going to play this little clip because it's fun. Thank you. Vice President Biden. Vice President. (laughs) That was a joke. (laughs) That was all set up. My president, Joe Biden. Vice President Harris. Our dear friend, uh, Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, All the members of Congress who are in attendance today, the members of cabinet, uh, it is good to be back in the White House. Um, It's been a while. I confess, uh, I heard some changes have been made (laughs) by the current president since I was last year. Apparently, Secret Service agents have to wear aviator glasses now. (laughs) The Navy mess uh, has been replaced by Baskin Robbins. (laughs) 
and there's there's a cat running around, <laughs> which I, I guarantee you, Bo and Sonny would have been very unhappy about. Uh, but uh, coming back, even if I have to wear a tie, which I very rarely do these days, um, <laughs> gives me a chance to visit with some of the incredible people who serve this White House and who serve this country every single day. That was that nice. Nice to see Obama. Comfort. So they're touting, you know, they came back for the, it was an anniversary. It was the today, the anniversary of signing the Affordable Care Act. Correct. Yeah. Something that a lot of people fail to understand is that the American healthcare system is a great target for crime, organized crime in particular. And uh, the head of the Russian mafia, Semyon Megillevich, loved to steal off uh, Medicare and stuff like that. And there was like one of the, I think it was just yesterday, a, a sprawling, huge indictment drop that involved multiple healthcare CEOs, you know, anti kickback stuff. Mm-hmm. I think 25 defendants, you know, if you look at um, the happiest website uh, in the world, justice.gov slash USAO slash press releases for all the press releases for the feds taking people down. There is a lot of healthcare fraud. They're going at pharmaceutical benefits managers. They're going at compounding pharmacies. There's, you know, every, you know, one of the reasons that American healthcare is so expensive is not just because it's good is because people are stealing from it left and right. And a lot of the opposition to the affordable care act or they're, you know, it helped secure, you know, a lot of the healthcare spend, you know, from being as easy to steal from. And, yeah, and uh, fraud protections because they were going to look, you know, going to check the books. Basically they weren't going to allow all these, all these different institutions to run their own schemes. And, uh, they did, and that's why they're able to bring some of the costs down. But you know, costs need to come way more down. But that's a really good point you're making about uh, the oligarchs and the and the Russians. Yeah, well, I, you know, and this is cool, and because uh, this is not a group that normally gets a lot of shout outs, but I I noticed who was on that investigation um, was the Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General, which also did a report about the crisis of how many foster kids are misplaced and potentially lost to sex trafficking in Missouri, which led to, uh, you know, a reshifting of some of the leadership, uh, the records building suddenly burning down of the children's division. I really uh, think that's happened coincidentally like that. Yeah, it was about a couple of weeks after I testified that uh, organized crime loved that kind of lack of care and detail to record keeping. And about, I think a week later, they had new, di- uh, they had new director. And three weeks later, the records building burned. Just People straight to the ground. About your Total incredible work you've been doing in Missouri because you've really um, done a lot of great work there. And I, I don't want to try even explain what it is you've done because you do a better job, obviously. But um, you've been fighting the good fight for the people of Missouri and for children in Missouri and, and making some real impact there. Um, it's uh, real hero stuff. So people should be very... Uh, <laughs> aware of that. And it's great work, Eric. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's a lot uh, to be done. But that, you know, that got, the lid got blown off that by HHS, Office of the Inspector General. And, th- you know, there are Inspector General's offices around uh, the federal government that are finding themselves uh, working with the FBI quite a bit and taking down crime at, uh, you know, an incredible pace. You know, I, we're, I know we're all looking at uh, the January 6th stuff. We're all looking at Donald Trump and lots of people are going to be very excited to see you know him wearing handcuffs at some point. That would be neat. But there's also some of the, the problems that led us to this situation because these kind of criminal schemes, let's say you're a healthcare CEO or whatnot, and you're engaged in this kind of criminal activity. Well, if somebody figures that out, that can be, you can be blackmailed for it. And, you know, if the person doing the blackmail is uh, a hostile foreign intelligence service, you have a problem. And, you know, after a while, the lack of rule of law and corruption is its own national security problem. So as much as we want to see certain bad guys go down and Ivanka Trump apparently did make an appearance at uh, the Jan 6 committee today. So who knows? Questions, apparently, whatever that means, but that's good. She was um, fifth or anything. She was just answering questions. So. Well, I, you know, we'll see. I, I haven't seen the, the readout from that. But in any event, you know, we all all want to see that happen. You know, more people go down for that. You know, the whole attempted coup d'etat 
that was a big deal. But there's also <laughs> other things. And there's a lot of trolls on Twitter, for example, that if, you know, whenever you put up one of these groundbreaking prosecutions that took people seven years to put together, you know, tireless work of a Department of Homeland Security, investigations, FBI, IRS, CI, all these different agencies. And these, you know, fire Merrick Garland, uh, do Trump, now do Trump, now do Trump. It's like such an obvious uh, trolling effort. It, it is annoying because I tweet a lot of uh, Department of Justice um, mm. tweets because they're fun because there's a lot of people going to jail there, right? There's mostly people going down, which is bad guys going down. And in fact, the Justice Department is doing an incredible job. And even though there's irritations by people that, you know, we don't know what's happening, that's OK. We don't need to know what's happening as long as we trust the people who are there and they're going to do a good job. And it seems to me that they are. And the signals lately have been that they are, in fact, investigating the people in a circle, if not the former president himself. But, you know, they should be. They should be. The well, and they just, they, and it. I think it was last, we didn't have narrative last week, but, you know, the DOJ finally came out and said, oh, no, we've, we've had grand juries open for two months. Yeah. And we've been sending out subpoenas. So it's like, for everyone who's like, you know, well, it looks like he's not in investigation. It's like people, he's get, they, they noticed the attempted coup d'etat, I guarantee. <laughs> and and lo and behold, it was, it was, they did. Aware. I have so much other stuff I've got to talk to you about. I always feel like this is not enough time tonight, but uh, it's tomorrow night you're coming back, but we also have a big interview tomorrow night, um, which I'll tell you about uh, later on. But I did want to just get your thoughts quickly on Elon Musk and Twitter. Uh, it's interesting. Weird, dangerous. Uh, he's concerning. a he, he's <laughs> a true. he's a quirky chap, isn't he? I, you know, he's a, he's you never chap. know what he's going to get up to. With lots of foreign backing and certainly alliances with the likes of the former president we were just talking about, with close ties to Vladimir Putin. So, you know, I mean, he's a wealthy guy, and sure, he should be able to influence some things. But you know, buying up nine percent of a company just because he, he doesn't like a policy is a he's always worrying. <laughs> but you know, yeah. that's, that's capitalism, I guess. That's how it works. So. Well, we'll go for Well, that. I'm interested. I'll, I'll keep paying attention to it. So seems likely that Trump will be back sooner than we think. Musk might even control the whole company sooner than we think, but we'll see how that goes. Oh, no, if, uh, if, if Trump will be back on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. let's hope not. <laughs> we'll see if Elon gets his company on. Earth. But actually, let me do on, on that point, though, I'm, I'm actually going to I'm going to pull back on that on thinking that it's such a bad thing for Trump to be on. I'll tell you why, because when you, um, you know, when you read some of these indictments, they have entire URLs that are HTTPS colon hack hack www.twitter.com. Boom. The username slash and then the numbers of the tweet. That is evidence in a federal trial. And a lot of the stuff that was used against Trump, uh, for example, in the Eastman, uh, the case of Jan 6 trying to get emails from John C. Eastman, the law professor uh, Federalist Society, Goomba, that guy, mm. you know, who just delivered what, you know, the court ordered him to because of the crime fraud exception. Um, they said, you do not get privilege because it's pretty evident that Donald Trump committed crimes with you. So <laughs> fork over the stuff, pal. And when you read the documents, the reasons given for this, you know, some of the facts that the government was trying to establish here, and this is a civil document, it's not criminal yet. You know, it's you had that the, you have the Twitter URL. So what happens on social media is really a thing. And if you commit, if you do things that are criminal using social media, uh, you've just created a public record that can go into your federal trial. Which you so, don't want your accounts canceled or blocked because that's where the record is. And if we lose that, it's annoying. So, in fact, you, what you're saying is it's good to have some of this record around. Um, we should say goodnight because we've taken up way too much of your time, Eric Garland. Uh, everyone can find you at Eric Garland. Plus, they can also find your podcast uh, everywhere. And it's called Game Theory, uh, which is a great podcast. Everyone should listen to that. Uh, while I was away, I did a little new promo for Patreon and asking people to support a narrative on Patreon because it's the only way we get to make these shows for you and the only way we get to bring uh, truth to light here. And one of the reasons I did this was also to focus about what you and I both did early on in our 2016 days. We were among the first to really point out to people what uh, Vladimir Putin was all about and have consistently been pointing that out for the last six years. And if that isn't a good enough reason for you to join Narratives, a Patreon program, then I don't know what is, but we hope you do because we really need your support. That's uh, patreon.com forward slash narrative. And with that, I'll leave you with a promo and we'll see you tomorrow night, Eric. See you then. Bye, everybody. When others called it a hoax, 
we didn't waver when they covered up and lied for Trump and others. We stuck to the facts through COVID, corruption, and a coup to a war in Ukraine at Narrative. We've been telling you the truth about Putin and Xi since 2016. Narrative, it's where truth lives. 